Okay, we are on chapter seven. It was when curiosity about Gatsby was at its highest that the lights in his house failed to go on one Saturday night. And as obscurely as it had begun, his career at Tremolaccio was over. Only gradually did I become aware that the automobiles which turned expectantly into his drive stayed just for a minute and then drove sulkily away. Wondering if he were sick, I went over to find out. An unfamiliar butler with a villainous face squinted at me suspiciously from the door. Is Mr. Gatsby sick? Nope. After a pause, he added, sir, in a dilatory, grudging way. I hadn't seen him around, and I was rather worried. Tell him Mr. Carraway came over. Who? he demanded rudely. Carraway. Carraway. All right, I'll tell him. Abruptly, he slammed the door. My Finn informed me that Gatsby had dismissed every servant in his house a week ago and replaced them with half a dozen others who never went into West Egg Village to be bribed by the tradesmen, but ordered moderate supplies over the telephone. The grocery boy reported that the kitchen looked like a pigsty, and the general opinion in the village was that the new people weren't servants at all. Next day, Gatsby called me on the phone. Going away? I inquired. No, old sport. I heard you fired all your servants. I wanted somebody who wouldn't gossip. Daisy comes over quite often in the afternoons. So the whole caravan Siri had fallen in like a card house at the disapproval in her eyes. There's some people Wolfsheim wanted to do something for. They're all brothers and sisters. They used to run a small hotel. I see. He was calling up at Daisy's request. Would I come to lunch at her house tomorrow? Miss Baker would be there. Half an hour later, Daisy herself telephoned and seemed relieved to find that I was coming. Something was up, and yet I couldn't believe that they would choose this occasion for a scene, especially for the rather harrowing scene that Gatsby had outlined in the garden. The next day was broiling, almost the last, certainly the warmest, of the summer. As my train emerged from the tunnel into sunlight, only the hot whistles of the National Biscuit Company broke the simmering hush at noon. The straw seats of the car hovered on the edge of combustion. The woman next to me perspired delicately for a while into her white shirtwaist, and then as her newspaper dampened under her fingers, lapsed despairingly into deep heat with desolate cry. Her pocketbook slipped to the floor. Oh my, she gasped. I, pick it, I picked it up with a weary bend and handed it back to her, holding it at arm's length and by the extreme tip of the corners to indicate that I had no designs upon it. But everyone nearby, included the woman, suspected me just the same. Hot, said the conductor to familiar faces. Some weather. Hot, hot, hot. Is it hot enough for you? Is it hot? Is it? My commutation ticket came back to me with a dark stain from his hand. That anyone should care in this heat, whose flushed lips he kissed, whose head made damp the pajama pocket over his heart. Through the hall of the Buchanan's house blew a faint wind, carrying the sound of the telephone bell out to Gatsby and me as we waited at the door. The master's body, roared the butler into the mouthpiece. I'm sorry, madam, but we can't furnish it. It's far too hot to touch this noon. What he really said was, yes, yes, I'll see. He set down the receiver and came toward us, glistening slightly, to take our stiff straw hats. Madam expects you in the salon, he cried, needlessly indicating the direction. In this heat, every extra gesture was an affront to the common store of life. The room, shadowed well with awnings, was dark and cool. Daisy and Jordan lay upon an enormous couch like silver idols, weighing down their own white dresses against the singing breeze of the fans. We can't move, they said together. Jordan's fingers, powdered white over their tan, rested for a moment in mine. And Mr. Thomas Buchanan, the athlete? I inquired. Simultaneously, I heard his voice, gruff, muffled, husky, at the hall telephone. Gatsby stood in the center of the crimson carpet and gazed around with fascinated eyes. Daisy watched him and laughed her sweet, exciting laugh. A tiny gust of powder rose from her bosom into the air. The rumor is, whispered Jordan, that that's Tom's girl on the telephone. We were silent. The voice in the hall rose high with annoyance. 
Very well, then, I won't sell you the car at all. I'm under no obligations to you at all. And as for you bothering me about it at lunchtime, I won't stand that at all. Holding down the receiver, said Daisy cynically. No, he's not, I assured her. It's a bona fide deal. I happen to know about it. Tom flung open the door, blocked out its space for a moment with his thick body, and hurried into the room. Mr. Gatsby, he put out his broad, flat hand with well-concealed dislike. I'm glad to see you, sir. Nick, make us a cold drink, cried Daisy. As he left the room again, she got up and went over to Gatsby and pulled his face down, kissing him on the mouth. You know I love you, she murmured. You forget there's a lady present, said Jordan. Daisy looked around doubtfully. You kiss Nick, too. What a low, vulgar girl. I don't care, cried Daisy, and began to clog on the brick fireplace. Then she remembered the heat and sat down guiltily on the couch, just as a freshly laundered nurse leading a little girl came into the room. Blessed, precious, she crooned, holding out her arms. Come to your own mother that loves you. The child, relinquished by the nurse, rushed across the room and rooted shyly into her mother's dress. The blessed, precious. Did mother get powder on your old yellowy hair? Stand up now and say, how do you do? Gatsby and I in turn leaned down and took the small reluctant hand. Afterward, he kept looking at the child with surprise. I don't think he had ever really believed in its existence before. I got dressed before luncheon, said the child, turning eagerly to Daisy. That's because your mother wanted to show you off. Her face bent down into the single wrinkle of the small white neck. You dream, you, you absolute little dream. Yes, admitted the child calmly. Aunt Jordan's got on a white dress, too. How do you like Mother's friends? Daisy turned her around so that she faced Gatsby. Do you think they're pretty? Where's Daddy? She doesn't look like her father, explained Daisy. She looks like me. She's got my hair and shape of the face. Daisy sat back upon the couch. The nurse took a step forward and held out her hand. Come, Pammy. Goodbye, sweetheart. With a reluctant backward glance, the well-disciplined child held to her nurse's hand and was pulled out the door just as Tom came back, preceding four gin rickies that clicked full of ice. Gatsby took up his drink. They certainly look cool, he said with visible tension. We drank in long, greedy swallows. I read somewhere that the sun's getting hotter every year, said Tom genially. It seems that pretty soon the earth's going to fall into the sun. Or wait a minute. It's just the opposite. The sun's getting colder every year. Come outside, he suggested to Gatsby. I'd like you to have a look at the place. I went with them out to the veranda. On the green sound, stagnant in the heat, one small sail crawled slowly toward the fresher sea. Gatsby's eyes followed it momentarily. He raised his hand and pointed across the bay. I'm right across from you. So you are. Our eyes lifted over the rose beds and the hot lawn and the weedy refuse of the dog days along shore. Slowly, the white wings of the boat moved against the blue, cool limit of the sky. Ahead lay the scalloped ocean and the bounding Blessed Isles. There's sport for you, said Tom, nodding. I'd like to be out there with him for about an hour. We had luncheon in the dining room, darkened too against the heat, and drank down nervous gaiety with the cold ale. What'll we do with ourselves this afternoon? cried Daisy. And the day after that, and the next thirty years? Don't be morbid, Jordan said. Life starts all over again when it gets crisp in the fall. But it's so hot, insisted Daisy on the verge of tears, and everything's so confused. Let's all go to town. Her voice struggled on through the heat, beating against it, molding it senseless into forms. I've heard of making a garage out of a stable. Tom was saying to Gatsby, but I'm the first man who ever made a stable out of a garage. Who wants to go to town? demanded Daisy insistently. Gatsby's eyes floated toward her. Ah, she cried, you look so cool. Their eyes met and they stared together at each other, alone in space. With an effort, she glanced down at the table. You always look so cool, she repeated. 
She had told him that she loved him, and Tom Buchanan saw. He was astounded. His mouth opened a little, and he looked at Gatsby, and then back at Daisy, as if he had just recognized her as someone he knew a long time ago. You resemble the advertisement of the man, she went on innocently. You know the advertisement of the man. All right, broke in Tom quickly. I'm perfectly willing to go to town. Come on, we're all going to town. He got up, his eyes still flashing between Gatsby and his wife. No one moved. Come on, his temper cracked a little. What's the matter anyhow? If we're going to town, let's start. His hand, trembling with his effort at self-control, bore to his lips the last of his glass of ale. Daisy's voice got us to our feet and out onto the blazing gravel drive. Are we just going to go? She objected. Like this? Aren't we going to let anyone smoke a cigarette first? Everybody smoked all through lunch. Oh, let's have fun, she begged him. It's too hot to fuss. He didn't answer. Have it your own way, she said. Come on, Jordan. They went upstairs to get ready while we three men stood there, shuffling the hot pebbles with our feet. A silver curve of the moon hovered already in the western sky. Gatsby started to speak, changed his mind, but not before Tom wheeled and faced him expectantly. Have you got your stables here? asked Gatsby with an effort. About a quarter of a mile down the road. Oh. A pause. I don't see the idea of going to town, broke out Tom savagely. Women get these notions in their heads. Shall we take anything to drink? called Daisy from an upper window. I'll get some whiskey, answered Tom. He went inside. Gatsby turned to me rigidly. I can't say anything in his house, old sport. She's got an indiscreet voice, I remarked. It's full of... I hesitated. Her voice is full of money, he said suddenly. That was it. I never understood before. It was full of money. That was the inexhaustible charm that rose and fell in it, the jingle of it, the symbol song of it, high in a white palace, the king's daughter, the golden girl. Tom came out of the house wrapping a quart bottle in a towel, followed by Daisy and Jordan wearing small tight hats of metallic cloth and carrying light capes over their arms. Shall we all go in my car, suggested Gatsby. He felt the hot green leather of the seat. I ought to have left it in the shade. Is it standard shift? demanded Tom. Yes. Well, you take my coupe and let me drive your car to town. The suggestion was distasteful to Gatsby. I don't think there's much gas, he objected. Plenty of gas, said Tom boisterously. He looked at the gauge. And if it runs out, I can stop at a drugstore. You can buy anything at a drugstore nowadays. A pause followed this apparently pointless remark. Daisy looked at Tom, frowning, and an indefinable expression, at once definitely unfamiliar and vaguely recognizable, as if I had only heard it described in words, passed over Gatsby's face. Come on, Daisy, said Tom, pressing her with his hand toward Gatsby's car. I'll take you in this circus wagon. He opened the door, but she moved out from the circle of his arm. You take Nick and Jordan. We'll follow you in the coupe. She walked close to Gatsby, touching his coat with her hand. Jordan and Tom and I got into the front seat of Gatsby's car. Tom pushed the unfamiliar gears tentatively, and we shot off into the oppressive heat, leaving them out of sight behind. And we'll stop right there.